So thank you for that warm welcome. So yes, the Orthodox Christian leadership was initiated around the end of 2018. They, in partnership with St. Vladimir's Seminary, put on an annual national leadership retreat or conference every year. We're headed into our sixth annual one. Um, It's every September. And I will say that it feels a little ironic or a little, uh, you know, conflictive being the head of an Orthodox leadership institute, just like his grace was saying today, you know, we call it a bishop's throne, but whose image is there? It's Christ. You know, we have one leader, we have one master, and we are only slaves, servants in his household. So that's really the mindset of this organization that any leadership that we may offer in our youth camps, in our youth work capacities, as priests, as curias, as choir directors, it's all in submission to the one true master and true leader. But we have, you know, thank God, functional hierarchies and and leadership roles, you know, capacities where we are asked to take care of a flock or this group of people for, for a time. And so we try to develop in those leadership roles as a servant in the Lord's household to better do the work that we are called to do. So what is servant leadership? I I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these slides because as youth workers, as youth camp directors, you guys got servant leadership down. Like you guys know what it's like to go to the ER with one of your campers who broke an arm and you're there till three in the morning. You're f- running on two hours of sleep and yet you get up and you're ready to do the task at hand. So you guys get servant leadership. You know that it's not about you. It's about servant. It's about serving the Lord's work that he has called you to do. And this is the model of what we would might call secular servant leadership. It really, the name servant leadership kind of started around the 1970s um, by a man called Robert Greenleaf who worked for AT&T. And he said, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one uh, to aspire to lead. This is not his model, but people who have studied him have offered this model saying, you know, it begins with that choice, that natural feeling, you know, to serve. And then you choose to love, you know, that service and and sacrifice is required. But eventually, like if you keep loving and sacrificing, you build your authority and your influence. And finally, you've earned your leadership role. So that's the secular model. It's done a lot of good in our corporations for, for people who have tried to live and lead their teams through servant leadership. But I think as Orthodox Christians, there should be some things that kind of unsettle us. And I'd like to just offer that to you for people kind of seeing what is servant leadership, you know, especially by the guy that started it out. As Orthodox Christians, there might be some things, yeah, but what are the, what are the yeahs and what are the buts here? Father Fred. Earned. Earned. Yes. Didn't earn anything. Didn't earn anything. That's the but. (laughs) Or that's, no, 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 wrong in so many ways. I didn't earn anything. Anyone else? Maybe, Holly, uh, the the authority. Um, Certainly, we do have authority for certain things, but in our Lord's service, he gave it all up. Right. To serve us. That's right. I would think that there's maybe a step below will, where it's a call, and there's a certain, uh, the will is said to accept that calling. Um, otherwise, the will is, what is it that we will to do our own whatever, or is it the will to answer Christ Paul for each one of us. I love it. Yes. Yes. We worked with um, people from seminary and they said, you know, I think I think the premise is wrong. It doesn't start with my natural feeling. You know, even the Lord Jesus Christ said, why do you call me good? No one but the Father is good. I'm not here to serve my will. I'm here to serve my Father's will. Right? Um, yeah, so I think some of the critiques that you're bringing out is it starts with me, my natural feeling, my will, rather than a call, as you said. 
Uh, it's driven by my own personal choices and feelings. I was talking with Andrew yesterday and I said, sometimes I feel like this country, we've replaced the God where our only hope is to serve his good and perfect will. And we've replaced it with a God who protects our freedom to choose. So I think there's, we like our freedom to choose. We want to say that God gives us freedom of choice, and he does. But who are we, sir? Is God protecting our freedoms to choose what we want to do? Or is there a better way to do what he's called us to do? Also, you know, all of this is directed by self. Do I, do I want to, I'm done serving and sacrificing. Yeah, I won't be a leader. I'll just, you know, do my menial tasks. It's, it's up to me. I just don't want that much responsibility. And like you said, status and authority is earned rather than bestowed, rather than granted. So I've used the term thulos. Probably, we, what, what does it mean? We might receive communion as thulos to theu. What, slave. And I'm glad you said the more awkward word. <laughs> we, we like to tame it down by calling it servant. But yeah, it's slave. You're a slave in the household of Christ, in the household of our Lord. It, and being a slave to him, the yoke is easy and his burden is light. We're a slave to something, to our fears, to our desires. We're all a slave to something. And we strive to be slaves in the Lord's households. Yes, slave of Christ. And like you said, it begins with the calling. Where do we hear that calling? We hear it in the word of God. Um, I just did a podcast last week where we were talking about King Josiah, who came after his grandfather, King Manasseh, who brought in all the pagan gods. And finally, like the Lord was like, enough, like destroy this temple. It's not working. And King Josiah, it's amazing. In Kings, he has got his team just all on the same page. They are working faithfully from the secretary to the high priest, to the overseers, to the carpenters, to the masons, even the people who are contributing their coins and the temple treasury so that they can work on their building project. I mean, it is running like a machine. It's like the best. We all want our parish councils to work like this. Smooth and running where everybody's on the same page. They didn't even have to keep accounting because everybody was so faithful. But then somebody found something in the temple treasury. Scripture itself presented King Josiah with the true treasure. It was scripture itself. He had it read to him for the first time. Rather than feel justified and pumped up and like running his great temple repair campaign, he rent his clothes. He's like, oh my word, we have this all wrong. Stop everything. We have got to pay attention to this scripture. We have got to pay attention to God's commandment for us. And what happened during King Josiah's reign? The Deuteronomistic, I always get that word mixed, Deuteronomistic reforms were all happening under King Josiah. He brought everybody, still that group of people from priests to overseers, everybody, but let's gather around the thing that builds us, this community, and that's the word of God. So it all starts there with that calling. What are we called to do? And King Josiah, when he heard it, he knew what he had to do differently. And it's the Holy Scripture that actually provides for the work of the body, you know, the calling. It's calling apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And it also talks about in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint from which it's equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love and it assigns a duty to us sorry I... yeah Romans 15 I need to get my other mouse here Romans 15 tells us that we have a duty to submit to one another in love come on little mouse and then from from love 
and from that duty of recognizing our, our space and what we need to do. We are bestowed. We don't earn our place in leadership. We are bestowed with whatever particular station we have in the body of Christ, whether it's chanter, altar server, prospera maker, Sunday school teacher, we all have some kind of duty that comes out from that calling, that I that calls for the specific work of the body and a duty to submit to one another in love, and from that love submitting to one another out of deference for Christ. So any other things that you might like to notice between what we submit as an orthodox framework for servant leadership, where the premise is very different, where leadership is not earned. Any other thoughts or things that you're seeing between the two models? Yeah. I mean, no bottle is perfect, but yeah, like, like it's, it's the Lord that provides for his house, right? It is, it's his teaching. It's his instruction that provides and it's massive and it's big and it has nothing to do with earning my leadership on my own natural feeling to, to will to serve. Yeah. Very different premise. I don't see authority, but I think that authority is coming from the bottom. Like that's the basis for it, maybe? Say, say again, Father. I see authority on the Dulos leadership. Um, like that was one of the levels on the, the secular model, but maybe that's coming from... Uh, yeah, well, and sometimes sometimes there is authority bestowed upon you, like your station in the church body, your station, your authority, your your scope, like what what is the work that you are called to do? And I, again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but, you know, when we work on our parish councils with with this model of servant leadership, we also kind of get into that area of false authority and false humility, kind of what we might think is polar opposites, where sometimes there is authority that you have, and you have to, like, you can't, like, dismiss yourself from it and say, oh, who am I to lead? Who am I to correct? Who am I to suggest that we do something different? Because if it's clear from what you're understanding in Scripture and, and you know, working it out with a, it might be your duty and responsibility to step into that authority and make those decisions. But you're right, we don't use the word authority on this model, but, but we do kind of tease out false authority and false humility. Thanks for bringing that up, Father. All right, so I would like to... Um, situational leadership is the colorful one there. So this is just another secular model, but I find it helpful, especially in thinking about how to use situational leaderships in the teams that we're developing. The teams that we're developing, you know, our camp staff, our youth worker staff, whatever we have. And it um, comes out of the servant leadership model. It's called situational leadership. Um, It was designed by Ken Blanchard from the 1970s. Oh, here I've got that. And um, he combined, it's really a nice way to approach like the task at hand or the work at hand with the relationships of the people on your team. Um, And then there's no, the big thing about this is that there's no single best style of leadership. You're always adapting in relationship to the one that you're serving based on their ability, their willingness, the context of what's going on, their capability. Um, So it's really a partnership model. You first, as, as the leader, you first understand what the needs are of the developing individual, and the goal is to adapt your leadership style to what they need. So first, the developing individual. Uh, The developing individual, really we're looking at two different things. We're looking at their competence level and their commitment level. Okay, And so between competence and commitment, you see that there could be fluctuations. Like there could be high competence and low commitment, maybe low commitment and high competence, maybe high in both categories or maybe low in both categories. And the idea as a leader is to adapt. 
Uh, any questions about the developing individual here? So this, like a developing individual, like, you know, maybe they're brand new on the camp staff. They've never done this before. They don't know the protocols about, you know, what they're expected to do. Um, competency is really low. But if they're new, their commitment might be really, really high. Like, I've been asked to be a counselor. I'm so excited to be here. Just tell me what to do. I'm ready to do it. So you adapt your leadership style to that high commitment but low competence. With the leader, this is the path that you might take through directing, where somebody might have high commitment but low competence, so you give them a lot of direction, through coaching, where they're um, a little bit low in both of those areas, like their commitment is laggering and they've got some competence, but it's not really there yet. So you're providing a lot of coaching, which involves give them some direction, but also, you know, encourage them because their enthusiasm is lagging a little bit um, into the supporting area where really they're showing quite a lot of competence, but they're really doubting themselves or maybe their commitment level is, is really waning. So, so you're not going in there telling them how to do the job. You're just giving them confidence that I, I know you've got what you need to figure it out. What can I do to support you? All the way into like the de delegating piece of it where um, your people on your staff may really know how to do their jobs really, really well and they're really committed. It's like you need to start leading your own teams. I need. You, would you be willing to do this task? And you don't have to give a lot of oversight. Ken Blanchard says that 55% of the people that have been studied and studied very, very carefully, like seeing how they lead people on their teams and one-on-one, 55% of us always tend to just choose one leadership style. He doesn't say which one it is. I would bet in this room most of us are probably either supporters or coaches. <coughs> like high emotional energy. We want to give that to our people. And so we may support almost all the time and kind of give low direction because we don't want to tell people what to do. Or we might be more of that coaching, like tell them what to do, but let's make sure we're on the same page. Let me read it. Let me say it again, just to make sure they know what to do. And let me give them a lot of support too. So most of us are probably in that orange or yellow range. 55% of us don't really adapt. 30, a little over 30% can go to two leadership styles. And I think it's around 10% can do three leadership styles and only 1% of the population who are in leadership roles can really adapt to what's needed. So let's go a little deeper on each of these. The red zone. This is the developing individual who is enthusiastic. They're hopeful, but they're inexperienced. They're eager, excited, curious, but unskilled. And so the leader in this in serving this particular individual needs to be more directive. They need to give some more direction, help plan, teach, show, monitor, this type of thing. So what does it look like potentially in practice with youth workers? I've just been asked to teach church school for our fourth graders. I'm so excited. I remember loving my teacher at that age, but I'm really nervous. What curriculum should I use? So as a leader... What is the better response? Is it A or B? I'll share a couple of great books with you. Come shadow me in my classroom. Let's meet to go through your questions. Or it's like, you're so creative. Like, of course you were asked to teach. You're going to figure everything out. You're going to be awesome. What do you think? A or B? A. A, yeah. Yeah, you do need to give more direction. And maybe for people who don't like giving direction, it's kind of like, oh, I know A is the right answer, but I really don't like telling what to, people what to do. I trust that they'll figure it out. This orange zone, the disillusioned learner. So this is somebody who is getting a little overwhelmed, a little demotivated. Things are harder than they thought. They're frustrated, discouraged, but they have shown to be somewhat competent. They have learned some things along the way. 
So as a coach, I mean, the best leader would be one who approaches it with coaching. Like, let's explore what you're feeling. Tell me more about it. What do you feel like you have learned? Let's clarify the work here. Um, Let's do some feedback, you know, what's working, what's not, that type of thing. And what does it look like in action? So my church school class of fourth graders, they're just so fidgety. It's so hard to keep them focused. I've tried so many different ways of presenting the parables of Christ, but when I ask the question to see whether they've understood the story, their answers are just way out in the field. It erupts in laughter. I just can't keep the class under control. So how should the leader or the mentor in this situation respond? Don't quit. If, if you quit, like, I know you're discouraged, but who's going to teach? Maybe you can just tell other teachers how to teach the parables. Or would it be, it sounds overwhelming. Tell me more about what's going, what's working and what's not working. If I came and helped with the classroom dynamics, maybe that could free you up with just teaching the, the parable. How can I help? So which, which is it, A or B? B, yeah. These are a little bit easy. <laughs> I, wanted the, I want it to be obvious. The yellow zone. Um, so this is the, the learner who is capable but cautious. So kind of self-critical, doubtful. They are capable and pretty skillful, but they're just feeling a little insecure, maybe a little bored. They don't have new challenges. So the leader should adapt his style to be supportive, asking, listening, reassuring, collaborating, facilitating, appreciating, valuing, maybe thinking through like some new experiences to keep them engaged. So what does this look like? So we've been, so this is the learner saying, we've been working through Christ parables. They seem to be really engaged and interested in the stories, but sometimes they ask really tough questions. And I'm not really sure how to answer them, but it's great. It's a great, dis- it's a great discussion. Sometimes it's hard to keep everyone focused on the main point, but there's, there's a lot working out well. So how should the mentor of this new Sunday school teacher respond? I've been hearing from parents and the kids and the kids that they're talking more about the Bible at home. It sounds like you're really engaged with learning. What would you recommend for someone in your position with respect to handling those tough questions and keeping focused discussion? Or would it be, well, I'll share a couple of teaching resources and you're welcome to come shadow me anytime. A. Yeah, A. Yeah, and I love I love this answer. Like people who are in this yellow developing zone, the what would you do question rather than giving them direction and being the answer man, have them tell you, have them work through in their own minds. What would they say to somebody in their position? That's a great way for young people to solve their own problems is you ask them, what would you say to your friend? What would you say to a friend if your friend were going through this? And it really helps them think in a way that helps them own the answer and implement it. And then this green zone, um, this is the self-reliant achiever. So they are confident, but not cocky. Like they are justifiably confident. They're consistently competent. They're inspired and they're inspiring other people. They're really an expert. They're working autonomously. They're self-assured. So this is a place where you need to adapt your leadership to delegate more things to them. Be more trusting. Be more confirming. Be more empowering. Um, what is be, give them a new challenge. So what does that look like in action? This has been a great year of teach, teaching church school to the fourth graders. They ask great questions about Christ's parables, and they make these brilliant literary connections throughout scripture. They use the parables to discuss everyday situations they're facing at home and school. They've grown closer two as friends. It was their idea to do a service project together once a month. The next work, next month we're going to a nursing home with art supplies to visit and create art together. So this is, this is somebody who's really figured out what to do with their fourth grade church school class, right? So as their mentor, how would you respond? I'd be happy to come join this fabulous classroom and, uh, 
and uh, focus on classroom management so that you can just keep teaching all this good stuff? Or would it be B, I think you should consider leading a teacher training workshop? B, yeah, they are ready for a new challenge. Yep, for sure. So with all of this, um, I want to also lean into this world that we have where children get ribbons for competing and, you know, let's talk about compliments first. So why is it that we want our children to be happy, that we don't really want them to do things that they're not comfortable doing sometimes. Why is it that we tell them, you are a great singer. You are so smart. You're a great artist. Like, why, why do we do that to our children? You know, there's so, ma- there's so many studies coming out that are saying, you know, As a parent, don't tell your kid how smart they are. Acknowledge how much work they have put into this, right? Don't we want that? Don't we want to be the same kind of leader to our children right now? Do we just want, you know, it's funny. I remember back in, I was a senior in high school. I I grew up in the Nazarene church and we went on this mission trip or choir tour or something like that. At the end of like this two week trip, Without, you know, any expectation that this was going to happen, the youth pastor gave everybody a piece of paper and he says, I want you all to vote on who was the servant above self. And so people wrote the names down of whoever it was in the group of who, who was the servant above self. And, and I'm like, why are we doing this? Like, you know, like let's remember Matthew 6 where when you give alms, don't sound the trumpets before you. Like, what? I'm going to take my certificate that I got the Servant Above Self Award and stand in front of the the pearly gates and say, but look, everybody said I was a Servant Above Self. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Why, Why do we, like, let's keep our compliments in check. I think people, I think children, especially as they grow into their older teen years, like corporate, let me say this, corporate America does such a good job of giving compliments, but they do that to extract value out of people, to get them to work even longer, to work even harder. Is that what we want? Do we want our kids to rely on our praise, our approval, our... our accolades of them or do we want them to be servants in the household of the Lord where they're happy to do what they're called to do without receiving public recognition I'm not saying don't ever praise a student or give affirmation like we know that sometimes based on development sometimes that affirmation is important but especially when we get into that area where somebody is really competent and they're committed let's not spoil it for them notice none of those things said to compliment let's not spoil it for them by having them rely on our praise do I seek to please God or do I seek to please men what do we want our children to do? Father Fred. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking, that the tension there between pleasing God and pleasing men. We, uh, we, we almost can't take compliments because it goes right to our head and we start to get more of the, the cause of all this and then we, we get an ego. It kind of destroys our slavery. Please God is the most important thing. That's what kind of goes back to it. Maybe we should teach our children that. You're doing it because it's your duty and you have one to serve. You know, you're doing it. Maybe that's all you need to say. You're doing it. You're doing it, yeah. Not good job. Yeah, Yeah. your grace. Having grown up in um, Fort Cox County, I remember even the public school system, we would never get from the teacher, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you did well. I mean, you know, my parents used to go to the parent teaching conference and they will never get praises of their kid, but rather how hard they work to do the assignments to accomplish all those tasks of them. And, uh, you know, the effort was acknowledged, but it was not, you know, at the end, there's the reward, you know, the gold star. I never saw gold stars on my papers until I got to 
the U.S. in high school in my tenth grade, I used to get gold stars, and you know, I was like, wow. So we grew up with that because I think the culture itself, being an Orthodox setting, it was breathing with this, this uh, air of, of servant uh, attitude, and sort of, uh, of, you know, the gifts come from God, and we put them to work, and we end up still being servants, not, you know, excellent servants, because there's no difference in how you serve, but rather you serve. Um, personally, I still have a hard time um, even acknowledging and adapting to this culture over here, especially at camp, the people, the priests, when I oh, Father, you're, you know, so excellent, or, and giving me words. My bishop always says, we don't give awards to priests for being excellent. Their work is their reward. Our work is our reward. The kids' work is already their reward. But I guess we have to be, on the flip side, um, also encouraging and motivating in the culture, which we live in nowadays, that's so negative, so, um, um, you know, kind of just putting things down. And we, we need motivation to, to do good work. So, I fight, with, I mean, my, my, I struggle with that in my, in my personal life too. What is the balance between complimenting and, and lauding and praising and yet keeping that humility and that, that humble acknowledgement that, you know, we have to all work hard and put into our, our efforts and the Lord is the one who rewards us and, um, and the Beatitudes are That's right. in heaven. But, well, if we get to heaven, we better get some praises from those around us. It's not worth it. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, we actually have language in the church to do this. Like, like, usually we only hear the priests. Like when we give a compliment, they, you know, thank God. Like they deflect and thank God. We can teach our children that mindset and why we, why we say those things. We can, you know, my, I, I've known a couple of priests who make it a point not to give a direct compliment to anybody from the envelope. It's always glory to God. I thank God for the service of the choir this morning. I thank God. Like the, the thanks and the glory goes to God first. And because you submitted to the work that the Lord had for you, I thank God for his work in you. And that's, they always make it a point never to say, you know, to get, oh, the choir sounded beautiful this morning. It's like, glory to God for his, for the service of the choir, you know, and it's these subtle things, but we can teach our kids this too. And I, I think they would be inspired by that message. They, they smell the hypocrisy. They smell like the self glorying things that we all do. And, and they want to live different lives. Let's show them that. The other thing that I want to talk about too it's kind of related but this area of service and getting instant gratification like you talked about gold stars like I don't know those of you who have dealt with toddlers and potty training like you know they go good job you're doing it good job and they flush the toilet and they get their gold star well you know we don't need gold stars to do that like we we are um, what is it Paul says when I was a child I spoke like a child I thought like a child I reasoned like a child when I became a man I gave up childish ways. I think through those young formative years, we give our children opportunities to kind of instantly see that when I serve, this is the impact that it has. When I go to a homeless shelter and I see someone who is poor and I give them something to eat and they say, thank you, like I feel good, like it makes me feel good to do those things. But that's for our children. And I remember there was this opportunity with our OCF group where they wanted to do a service project and somebody was assigned to like find some different things to do. And, and, um, then the, the discussion really became around like wanting to interact with the people so that we could see instantly the impact that we were having. And it became an opportunity to teach like, are we really doing this to get our warm fuzzies to see the impact that we have or 
maybe we should do this service project where, you know, somebody had called the Pregnancy Helpline Center. We thought there would be an opportunity to be there and help them help distribute clothes or whatever. Well, what the center needed, what they needed, what the service was, what the work that we were called to do was to come and fold clothes to prepare for it. And it's like, maybe we can do this and we may never know the impact that we have. We can just do this quietly. Glory to God. And we've helped and we may never know. And I think as we mature our young people, we can give them these te teaching opportunities to think about, like, are we really doing this for our own gratification, our own warm fuzzies, our own feeling of importance of having served somebody who is lower than us? Or are we really willing to do the hard work, have it go against our ego, even say, ugh, this is kind of like boring, it's kind of hard. Well, when you get that feeling, that might be an indication that you're actually submitting to the Lord's will rather than your own. And I think we can teach our kids that. Um, that's a, a hard thing. That's, that, that is not an easy thing. No. Uh, not as a parent, not as a priest, not as a youth worker. I mean, I'm just speaking for me, of course. I mean, it does everything that you're saying reminds me of our Lord's words to the religious leaders of this day. You know, how can you receive honor from God when you receive honor from one another? Um, you know, and that's, I, I think, you know, sort of uh, not be always in us. Um, our kids, whether they're ours or the schools or whoever's, or the, the coaches, whatever, um, I mean, there's always carrots dangled in front of them. So we get used to going after that carrot. But it's very ingrained in us, you know. Um, and some people, you know, I guess some people need a little bit of that. Um, you know, um, the good work that they do is good work and godly work. And sometimes they need that carrot to sort of like, and I understand that it's it's not the way we're going, the way that you're talking about is a harder way. Um, it, it's, it's much longer lasting. It's much more fulfilling in the end. But our kids are so used to having carrots sort of dangled in front of them that I'd say we'd have to be careful about how we effect this so that it doesn't become anti effective. Right. You know. Is that adapting move them towards yeah. this more than simply removing it. Right. Only because we've been so ingrained. Right, right. And and I'm like even with the model, it's all about adapting the style. But I bet everybody in here, you're in here not because you were told how great you were. You're in here because you actually went through that hard work of like, oh my word, am I here because I'm just a people pleaser? And maybe some of you have already like gone through that and realized like, you know, how your ego may have led you into the work that you're doing. But now like you're still here because you're here because it's not about you. It's about doing the Lord's work that he has for you. Don't we want to share it? Don't. Don't we want our children to have the same opportunities? We know that it's painful, but we know that it's worth it, right? The next part... Oh, let me, let me go through this. So in the past... Um, so think about yourself as a developing learner. All of us are learners, and all of us may have like leadership responsibilities. In terms of your own development, could anybody share a story of like what something new that you're trying to do in the last one to three years? And where are you along this developing area? Are you like an enthusiastic beginner right now? Is What's your commitment level? What's your competence level? Can anybody just share a, re a self-reflection on that right now with something new that they're engaged in? Learning a new language, starting a new ministry. I can give you something that happened. I don't know if, if everybody felt this, but when COVID hit, the new ministry went online. And uh, Connie and I and those that we were working with felt completely sort of incompetent to do anything. You know, uh, what are we going to do with summer camp in this case and then following on summer camp? Um, and I would echo the sentence of my sister, who's a teacher. 
uh, high school level teacher, just she, she said she's never worked so hard in her life as when she had to adapt. Yes. Um, and she's a, she was a speech pathology major and, and uh, teaches kids with special needs. And so there's even more challenge. There were even more challenges. I've been talking about what she was going through to help us with what we were going through. Um, in any case, feeling completely incompetent. Um, with regard to uh, you know what we needed to do, uh, highly motivated because we needed to do something. You know our ship had been burned, and that we needed to survive. Um, and so, um, just that process of um, just a couple of things in it. One, trying to convince the people around us that it would be good, mm-hmm. that it could be good, was next to impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the biggest challenge right up front um, because there was really a lot of low morale. Um, you know, how can this even touch camp or whatever? How can we even do anything that the kids would be interested in or get anything? I mean, there was just a, there was a huge problem up front. We didn't quite recognize it. We, we, we did relatively quickly. Um, in the end, skipping way ahead, um, just... The, the sort of lesson that we all learned after going through this together, because we just brought people on and we asked a lot of questions, we had a lot of meetings, of course, like everybody else did. In the end, we just we realized that the, the lesson that came out of it was that God knows how to feed his people. It's right. that we had to walk to the place where he was going to feed his feed people. Feed us, yeah. And we just didn't I love know where that. it was. Yeah. Because we had never done it before. Yeah. Um, but we just got walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. And he fed his people. Yeah. And that was sort of the lesson like, just do the work, just keep walking. Yeah. You'll find the spot. Yeah, we were brought out into a virtual wilderness where he fed his people. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm I love that. I, yeah. I didn't know that God could feed his people from the gospel. I learned it online. Yeah. Yeah. From the people, um, 5,000 to 4,000, I learned it yeah. online. Well, that that's like a much more amazing story than than what I what I'm was meaning to do with this slide. Which you Sorry. you got it. No, 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 no. It was awesome. But um, what I mean to say is, if you're learning something, it's really nice if you can bring. So you probably went through all of the, these areas. Like you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's figure this out. You know, that red level. Like, oh my word, this is really hard to do, and we can't convince people to like. I think I we're kind of getting this down and now you've got it figured out. So you've gone through that whole process, right? What I mean to say with this particular slide is it's really helpful for the person mentoring you or leading you if you can articulate where you are with your commitment level and with your competence level so that you can ask for the leadership, the mentorship that you need. It will really help your leader out. And if you can teach the people that you're leading how to articulate Articulate their commitment level or their competence level, you know, it will help you adapt to wherever they need to be. Likewise, it's always good to bring self awareness into your supporting behavior. Um, have you thought about where you might be? Like if you were in the 55%, what's your, what's your one go to? Anybody kind of live in the red realm where you're just kind of giving direction all the time? How about in the the orange? <laughs> we have we have a brave one. Yes, a lot of people who work in like sciences and financials, like they, those leaders tend to be very directive. You know, just because they're having to give a lot of information all the time and and very less supportive. Um, in the orange realm, like the coaching, lots of direction and lots of support. Anybody live in that realm most of the time? Good. Some people who are so for how how about the yellow one where it's more just supportive, low direction. I trust you can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody that really kind of lives in the delegating realm is like, hey, could you do this? I think you could do this. Would you do that for me? Anybody just a the delegator? <laughs> That's good. But it, it's good. It's good to be aware of where you are so that you might bring some, you know, potential. Do you have a question? I just have a comment. Yeah. So um, so our ministry in the Serbian diocese is a lot different than a lot of yours. Uh, ours is youth run, so we don't have a lot of adults. I think there's only three of us. Our, our youth director, who is a priest in Kadehe, and then myself, and then... Um, 
Anastasia, who's a convert, um, but sits in the Greek, works for the Greek church. Um, so I find myself more in that coaching because I'm still working on developing more people to help run the youth. We've lost a lot of people over the pandemic and stuff, but the ones that are there, they need that extra directive because they're not used to being in leadership positions. Um, and uh, then we have others who are like super engaged and super enthusiastic, but then get overwhelmed and burn themselves out. And sometimes I even fall into that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see how, you know, even with just one group, how different everyone is and how different you have to approach everybody because not everybody is a natural leader and not everybody is I like, really understand what their job is there but I just mm -hmm. want to comment on that that this really opened up my mind to seeing it from a different perspective oh good seeing how you have to adapt because that's the only way to really survive right so I think you know I said I'm kind of the yellow low drive high support I, I think that's kind of my natural inclination because I like when people give me room to play. Mm -hmm. I, like, my personality, like, do not tell me exactly how to do it. I will have no energy to do it. But give me, like, what you want to accomplish and, like, you know, encouragement and, like, you know, by God's grace, I'll figure it out. So that's my, like, but if I can tell by other people that's not working for them, I will put them in the box that I wouldn't want to be in and be like, okay, do it this way. But, like, I aspire to being like, but if you can think of a better way... Mm -hmm. like it doesn't have to be this way because I like that creativity but I know for some people that just drives them mad like tell me how to do it right, what right. you want me to do right right so. Yeah, that's interesting that people tend to lead the way that they want to be led, all things being equal. But but there are, but you're right. There are some people who just need, you know, a much more linear path, like just tell me the steps and yeah. Yeah, that's all all really good reflection. You're going to send this to us. I'm it's my head's going crazy because I all of my events that we do in our ministries like each ministry has a different box. So it's like, all right, this I'm doing all everything myself in the directing in this one, but I want to do more supporting and like delegation. But the things that I delegate, I'm like, well, I want to come, like, I want to support you. Like, how can I support you? And it's like really annoying how it's like, okay, this one I do camp, I do this, and like the basketball stuff, I'm doing this, and then the dancing, I'm not part of. And so it's interesting, and I want to like bring this back to my people and be like, we all need to be in these four boxes. Yeah, and adapting and moving and being aware of where we are at developmentally and then also adapting our leadership. And really, I'd say, like, if you want, like, a really great team, like a, like camp staff, you kind of, like, want to have people in all of those boxes developmentally because you're kind of building your bench, you know. You, you want diversity. You don't want everybody to be newbies. You don't want everybody kind of, like, beating to their own drum either and just delegating everything. Well, I mean, if... If they're all at that level, like you've got a phenomenal team. Where, you know, if they're really like you're all on the same page with your mission and vision, and all you have to do is like who's doing this, who's doing that. But that's pretty amazing. But it's but then where's the space for the new people to grow and develop? So that's why you kind of need. It would be wonderful to have people in each of those categories there. Yeah. And do the people that are do the, the ones that you're sort of leading are they in multiple boxes or multiple events like in other words the people that are working on one thing are they also working on get on another event with you too and um, on another? so we uh our clergy we pick clergy to be the chairman of everything we do mm -hmm. um so two of our clergy are also camp directors one does dance one does basketball so that's interesting but then you put when we're in that setting there are different people and they have different positions well, so yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I'm sort of asking because sometimes yeah. it's great to see people in one event and they're sort of like, they need a lot more direction, but then they skip to another event and man, just let them go. Mm -hmm. you right. know, and they're awesome. You know, and then they come to another event. I'm just curious because I see that with the stuff that we do. It's just, in one event, okay, they're just, they need more direction. Another event, they need to let them do it on their own. Right. Sometimes I'm like, all right, let's reel it back. Yeah. In. Like, yeah. I'm a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of reeling it back in, I have a, sorry, I know we got started late and it's 1035. Do I have just a couple of minutes for this next little five minutes? Okay. Say again. Oh, okay. Okay. 
wants to stay longer, they can. But check. Okay. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll kind of buzz through this. You have this slide. This is just kind of a nice, so I'm shifting now instead of like your mentoring individually people on your teams, you know, and kind of adapting to what each of your people need. Um, this is a great way to kind of see yourself as an, as a contributing member on a team. So no matter this, this design here was, um, built by Pat Lencioni and the table group. Um, it's just kind of a fun way to like talk about what you bring to the table, what your competencies are, what your working geniuses are, what really frustrates you about working on a project or, um, a particular mission, um, in your working life. Um, so, so he suggests that everything that we have people who kind of operate in this genius of wonder where they just like notice things and ask the questions, you know, like, why is it that we haven't interacted with our new immigrant neighbors in our church? Or why is it that, you know, the men sit with men and the women with women and the teens with teens at coffee hour? They just ask the questions. The inventors are those who say, let's invite the immigrant people to our church for a, a barbecue. Or I have an idea. Let's, let's assign people tables to sit at a coffee hour to get people mixing, mixed up. You know, they just, they have ideas. They want to solve those questions. The discerners are people who can kind of, they've got like a good intuition about those inventions. Like, you know, I'm not sure we could get those immigrant neighbors to come to our church, but maybe we could do a picnic out in the public park, you know, in the neighborhood. Or I don't think, I think people would react strongly to being assigned tables. Maybe we could do that differently. Maybe we could get people, keep people in each of those groups to come up with an idea. The galvanizers, these are like your salespeople. These are the people with the megaphone at camp who are like, okay, guys, we're going. Everybody get ready to do this. Everybody jump into the lake. You know, like they're the people who are like, this is what we're doing. And we're so excited to do it. And come on, everybody, follow me. We're going to do this. They're the people who really bring enthusiasm. It's like, yeah, and we're going to have brats and, and a trampoline out at the picnic. And, you know, they're, they're just the ones who get people really excited about it. The people in the E group, the enablers, are ones who say, sounds great, tell me what to do. I'll, I'm there for you. I'm there for you. And enablement is not like a negative word in this in this system. It's like, I will enable you to get this work done. Like, I believe in this mission. Tell me what to do. And the T's are those who just like to get things across the finish line. You know, they love the check boxes and they love checking off their list. And they are all about, what are the results? Do we do, like, do we have all the supplies ready for that picnic? Do we have, you know, do we have a date on the calendar for this coffee hour event? that we're going to do. Like, let's do results. Let's get it across. Let's take that ball across the finish line. It's just a fun way to, and I can send you these slides with a list of questions. You can also go to tablegroup.com and have your teams take this. It's a fun way to discuss it. Um, I would say the most important thing, though, it, you sure? Okay, I will slow down. But this this was one important slide. Like whether or not you do this little team assessment with the widget and the table group, it, it's just a, a nice way to like figure out where your strengths are, where your competencies are, um, where your working frustrations are, so that as a team you can take care of each other and you can still go through the entire widget. I feel like this slide, and I didn't get a printout of this, but so you might want to take a picture. I'll send you the slides here. But but this is a really powerful exercise and just building your team and kind of being vulnerable with each other and sharing what you think the Lord has provided you with to bring to this ministry, to this, to this camp staff, to this, um, effective ministry group. Um, and it kind of goes in order of like, as you develop your team, how deeper can you get with like self-reflection and admitting your struggles or saying, Hey, hold me accountable to this development goal. And the development goal may actually be in something where, where it's your gift, but you just want to get it a little bit better. You want to be faithful to that gift. So you want, you really want to invest in it and, and 
bring more intentionality to that. Um, so when you have built more trust with your team, so, so a good exercise to start with is just do a round robin where, where just do the first question. What do you feel like the Lord has blessed you with that you bring to this ministry? And you can just do a round robin with that. If there's a little more time or a little more trust and vulnerability that you've built with your team, then you can start asking them to stretch themselves and ask them about a development goal. If there's more, ask them to reflect on the struggle. And, you know, I know that I am not good at galvanizing people. I freeze up when I get behind the microphone. It's not something I'm good at. I really rely on you, Father Fred, to take that microphone. I'm behind the scenes. I'm doing everything. But thank you for being there for me because I, I'm not that person, you know. Um, when there is more trust with the team, then the exercise you can do is reflect back to your team and say, you're right. You bring a lot of creativity to this ministry. I appreciate you for doing that. You're right. You bring a lot of just direction and no nonsense. And like the goals are clear. Thank you for that. You know, so that they can reflect back. Yes, I hear you. And I agree with you. Um, when there's more trust, you can talk about those goals and how you might hold each other accountable to those. And when there's more trust, when somebody admits their struggle or like, I'm not good at this or I really need help with this, that's when as a team, it's like, you're right. You do talk to think, but it's, it's okay. Um, I know that you're going to try to like ask three questions and not be the first to speak in the room. So thank you for doing that. But I acknowledge you that you say that you're, that you talk too much and that you're the first one to share an opinion. You're right. You do that. And it do, it does get annoying, but you know, we're a team and we're going to do this together, but you bring so much other value, you know? Um, the other thing that you can do as a team that's really helpful is that written 360, where as a leader, you may ask the entire team to say, what are the top three things that um, Andrew brings to this team? And you get the whole team, you know, to write it down. If there is more trust, you might say, what would be one development area that you might suggest for Andrew? And then as a leader, I would say with discernment and remove the outliers. You know, if like five people are saying it, this is good feedback for him. But if only one person is saying and it's really negative and I don't think that Andrew is really ready to hear this, I'm going to leave that out of the written 360. But that written report can be really validating and it can really bring a lot of self-awareness to the team. Any questions on this? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Were you connecting this with these genius characters? It could be or could not. Like, like the genius thing is a way to talk about it, but this is just an open thing where you don't have to have any model at all. It's just like this exercise in self-awareness and team building and let's work together here. Um, is that part of the handout or not? It's not in that handout, but I it'll be on this video, and I'll send the slides to Natalie, too, so that can be distributed as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I will leave you there with a little bit of time to go have a break before the picture. So thank you. <laughs>